Hello, welcome, and thank you for joining us. I am Susan Winkler and have the privilege of serving as the Chief Executive Officer of the Reagan Udall Foundation for the FDA, and the Foundation is pleased to support this important discussion about recent draft guidance from FDA on the topic of real-world data and real-world evidence to support regulatory decision-making. I'm going to do a bit of light housekeeping, and then we will jump into the content. So we have more than 1,400 people registered for today's workshop, and I hope that a number of you have been able to join us live. We are so pleased with the interest in the conversation today. For those of you who submitted questions as part of the registration process, we have those, and I will be raising as many of those as we can in the question and answer session of the webinar. And then as many of you know, but I will remind you, the speakers will not be discussing any specific regulatory actions or decisions in today's discussion. But speaking of that discussion, we welcome your active engagement. Please submit questions or comments using the Zoom Q&A function. Also, the recording from today's meeting and the slides will be posted on the Foundation's website after the meeting. Um, we also encourage you to submit your comments and questions about the draft guidance to the Federal Register. So let's get a little orientation to our next hour together. In just a moment, Dr. John Concato will provide opening remarks, and then Dr. Matur Rahman and Dr. Pallavi Mishra Kalani will present an overview of the draft guidance. And then finally, we'll have time for questions and answers with our team from FDA. As a reminder, some of you have been joining us regularly, and thus far we've done four webinars on each of the four guidance documents released by the agency in this topic area, and today we are exploring the fifth guidance document. If you're interested in viewing the recordings of the prior webinars, please visit the Foundation website at reaganudall.org. Now, one more reminder for why we are all here today. The agency recently released draft guidance on the topic of considerations for the design and conduct of externally controlled trials for drugs and biologic products. A link to the uh, guidance it can be found in the Zoom chat now or will be there shortly. There's also a link on the website with our other event materials. I will note that I have my copy at the ready. Um, to, as we prepare to hear from our speakers, it's only 17 pages. It's worth the printout so that you can follow through, follow along and, and highlight and mark up as we have the discussion. And as I noted, but it's worth reiterating, the agency wants to hear comments and questions from the public. So please submit yours either here in the Zoom Q&A box or to the docket listed on the screen. With that, I am going to step out of the way and turn it over to our colleagues from FDA for the, uh, this important discussion. To kick us off is our first speaker, Dr. John Concato, who is the Associate Director for Real World Evidence in the Office of Medical Policy in FDA's Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. Dr. Concato, I'm going to step out of the way. Uh, thank you very much, Susan, and um, welcome to all. If I could have the next slide. As Susan clearly said, we're here to discuss what we call in shorthand our externally controlled trial guidance, draft guidance, that is. Next slide, please. And as with the prior webinars in this series, let's anchor today's session to the 21st Century Cures Act of 2016. Presumably everyone on this call is aware that as a result of the act, FDA established a program to evaluate the potential use of real world evidence to either support a new indication for a drug that's already been approved or to satisfy post-approval study requirements. We're really here today standing on the shoulders of the 2018 draft real-world evidence framework. And as you saw on an earlier slide, uh, FDA has issued draft guidance for industry in September, October, November, December. Those are the four guidances that you saw. Uh, not on the list because it's more procedural, but please be aware, and it's on our website, there's a final guidance on submitting documents with real world evidence that was issued in September of 2022. That's again, more of a procedural uh, document, but that's also informative. And then I cannot overemphasize the fact that the standard for substantial evidence remains unchanged, whether we're talking about real world evidence or uh, non real world evidence often just referred to as clinical trial evidence. And specifically our commitments under the Prescription Drug User Fee Act 6 were met uh, and we're now in Producer 7, of course, and we're not here to talk about that program, but we are here uh, to talk about the guidance, which is on the next slide. 
uh, just in terms of uh, putting it into a big picture uh, in context of our 2018 framework that I mentioned, which is about FDA's real world evidence program. Uh, it should be clear that this applies to the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, and the Oncology Center of Excellence. Uh, the Center for Devices and Radiologic Health and other centers for that matter have their own regulations and their own robust real world evidence program, but we're here today to talk about drugs and biologics. More generally, uh, the program itself involves quite a bit of work in the four categories of internal agency processes, external stakeholder engagement, uh, demonstration or research projects, and what we're here to do today, which is to talk specifically about guidance development. If you want to see the framework, uh, the, the URL is provided at the bottom of this slide. Next slide, please. And here is just uh, closing the loop on, on where we are. This is planned FDA Real World Evidence Guidance for uh, 2023, or so-called CEDAR Guidance Agenda. And as you see, we have uh, three guidances in the works. Today, we're talking about considerations for the design and conduct of externally controlled trials for drug and biological products. We also have in development considerations regarding non-interventional studies, as well as using clinical practice data in RCTs. Uh, from a big picture point of view, we have had prior guidances on data sources, EHR claims and registries, another one on data standards, and then a regulatory consideration. So these three all are in what might be called the uh, design category or bucket. And we're pleased to be here today to talk about externally controlled trials. Next slide, please. So without further uh, delay, I want to turn things over to my colleagues, Dr. Motia Rahman from the Office of Medical Policy and Dr. Pallavi Mishra Kalyani from the Office of Biostatistics, who will walk us through uh, the guidance. Uh, Motia, you're up first. Thank you, John. So here we are to talk about the drop guidance, the externally controlled trials. So I'm Motia Rahman, working in the Office of Medical Policy, RW Analytics team as a senior epidemiologist, and my colleague, Dr. Pallavi Mishra Kalyani, who is a supervisory mathematical statistician in the Office of Biostatistics at CEDAR, also provide her insights on the guidance. So next slide, please. So this is the summary slide. So the focus of the guidance is to study the importance of the design considerations, such as to finalize the protocol before analyzing data, data considerations for the external control arm, that is various comparability issues across the trial arms, analysis considerations. So point to be noted, FDA does not recommend a particular approach, and these are decided on a case-by-case -case basis, and considerations to support regulatory review, for example, access to patient-level data. Next slide, please. This is an excerpt from the table of content. Next, please. So the background section of this draft guidance discusses types of external controls, such as the use of historical or concurrent controls. It also talks about the suitability of externally controlled trials and patient comparability of treatment and the control arms. However, this guidance does not address about external controls, such as using summary level estimates instead of patient level data. It also does not discuss reliability, including data accuracy, completeness, traceability, and relevance of various sources of real world data. Next, please. The section three of this guidance talks about the design and analysis of externally controlled trials. I'll go over the design considerations, and my colleague, Dr. Mishra Kalyani, will discuss data and analysis considerations. Next, please. The overview section. So sponsors should finalize the study protocol prior to initiating the externally controlled trial, including selection of the external control arm and analytic approach, rather than selecting the external control arm after the completion of a single arm trial. The estimate framework can be used to help design an external control trial. The estimate, as the guidance mentioned, is comprised of the study population, treatment of interest, comparator, outcome of interest, handling of intercurrent events, and summary measures. Sponsors should pre-specify plans regarding how to measure and analyze data, important confounding factors and sources of bias. In general, a good understanding of the natural history of the disease and prognostic factors is needed. And on a practical note, 
some confounding factors may be missing or measured differently in the external control arm compared to the treat matter. As a matter of general principle, the source population across both the arms should be as comparable as possible. Next, please. As you continue with this section, the guidance talks about evaluating the extent of confounding and bias and analytic methods to reduce such biases. They're very important in conducting external control trials. Sponsors also need to understand the prescribing patterns in the external control population. For example, who in the eligible population are more likely to get a control drug? Is there any particular pattern or not, et cetera. With all the challenges in mind, externally controlled trials are more likely to provide convincing results when the effect size is large and the outcomes of interest are objective and well characterized. Next, please. In the characteristics of the study population section, the guidance discusses about patient comparability across the two arms and the eligibility criteria. The population across both the trial arms should be as comparable as possible, as we keep on mentioning. While accounting for baseline characteristics, specific considerations should be given to whether relevant confounding factors are known and well characterized, whether such factors are captured and assessed properly, and whether analytic methods can sufficiently address differences across the groups. Another consideration is how eligibility criteria can be applied to the external control arm to get comparable population with the treatment arm. And unless a concurrent control group is used, sponsors should consider whether diagnostic criteria and relevant baseline factors have changed over time. All this should be pre-specified in the protocol. Next slide, please. Next is the treatment attributes. So potential imbalances in terms of treatment of interest, such as drug adherence, dose, timing of initiation and duration of treatment and receipts of additional treatments across the two trial arms can impact the confidence in the results of the externally controlled trials. And unlike clinical trials where data collection is protocol defined, external control arm derived from the routine clinical care may lack detailed information on concomitant and supportive therapies the characteristics administration of such drug, such as drug formulation, dose, strength, frequency, the duration, rules for dose modification or discontinuation, etc. In addition, patients' health-seeking behavior, access to care, insurance status, etc., can also influence the treatment selection. Such factors should be adequately accounted for in externally controlled trials. Next slide, please. This section in the guidance talks about index time, that is the time zero, which is critically important in externally controlled trials to avoid biased effect estimates. In particular, determination of the index date in the treatment arm and the external control arm should avoid analysis that include a period of time, current code immortal time, during which the outcome of interest could not have occurred in one of the two arms. This time, referred to as immortal time, and the bias aroused from this is termed as the immortal time bias. Failure to account for this bias may make the drug seem more effective than it actually is. So next slide, please. In terms of outcome assessment, knowledge of the particular treatment by patients, caregivers, clinicians, or investigators can potentially lead to biased estimates. So whenever possible, the outcome should be assessed blinded to the treatment status. In some cases, this activity may require re-adjudication by blinded independent central review. Outcomes typically used in randomized control trials may be difficult to ascertain and evaluate in a real-world data source. In general, outcomes are more likely to be recorded when events are objective and or require immediate medical attention as in the case of stroke or myocardial infarction, as an example. Timing of outcome assessment. In real-world data, the timing and frequency of outcome assessment are determined during routine clinical care, whereas outcome assessment in the treatment arm are protocol specified. Even though external control arm data can come from another clinical trial, the approach to outcome ascertainment can still differ from the treatment arm, 
sponsors should ensure whether the availability and timing of outcome assessment are sufficient and comparable across both the trial arms. Next slide. Changes in diagnostic criteria over time can introduce bias when analyzing outcomes, especially when using a non-contemporaneous external control arm or when using a reasonably contemporaneous external control arm that reflects a different diagnostic standard of care. Again, differential capture of intercurring events may make it challenging to interpret the treatment effect. For example, initiation of ancillary therapy after treatment with the drug of interest or protocol determined in the clinical trial, whereas the real-world data may not accurately capture additional therapies, potentially confounding the treatment effect. As another consideration, potential lack of standardization in the definitions and use of certain clinical outcomes assessment in real-world data can lead to bias in the measurement from an external control arm. Accordingly, clinical outcomes assessment that are acceptable in randomized control trials may not be fit for use in an externally controlled trial. So that concludes the design consideration section. I'll now hand it over to my colleague, Dr. Mishra Kalyani, to discuss the subsequent sections of the guidance. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rahman. Uh, I will begin with the discussion of the data considerations for externally controlled trials. Uh, if we could go to the next slide, please. In general, data uh, for externally controlled trials or for the external control arm could come from two primary sources. The first is from clinical trials and the second would be from real world data. With respect to each type of data source, we may have different considerations for the design aspects of an externally controlled trial, some of which are listed on the following slides. So data from clinical trials may have a potential advantage over real world data in that we may be able to establish comparability of populations with respect to important factors like eligibility criteria, treatment administration, patterns of care, recording of concomitant medications, and outcome assessment. However, most often, clinical trial data that's used for an external control arm comes from previously conducted clinical trials, so there may be a differential timing of data collection. This may be of particular concern when the assessment and management of a disease changes over time, or when there are predictive or prognostic biomarkers in the patient population which have become known over time. Other concerns could be that bias could arise from the selection of an externally controlled arm from a completed trial where the outcome is known. Um, and this may be particularly true if the results of the external control arm are inconsistent with prior experience. Next slide, please. On the other hand, data from real world data sources may be more contemporaneous because it can be collected during the same time as the experimental arm of the ex externally controlled trial. However, it may be difficult to establish data comparability with regards to participant characteristics, timing and frequency of data collection and patterns of care from real world data as it is often collected for non-research purposes. In particular, there can be specific concerns regarding missing data from real-world data sources, which may threaten the validity of the results of an externally controlled trial. Insufficient information on relevant clinical characteristics, such as prognostic factors for the outcome of interest, may prevent an appropriate comparison. Next slide, please. We have a very nice table in the guidance that provides considerations for assessing comparability of data across trial arms. And in that table, we list several categories of um, the, that can be considered in the assessment of comparability, including time periods, geographic region, diagnosis, prognosis, treatments, other treatment-related factors, follow-up periods, intercurrent events, outcomes, and missing data. All of these factors are provided with some specific considerations for each category in the guidance, 
And the relevance of each of these can vary on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on the attributes of the treatment arm, the selected data source for the external control arm, and the stage of the trial, design, conduct, or analysis. Next slide, please. In our last section, uh, our last subsection of section three, we discuss analytical considerations for externally controlled trials. Next slide, please. We start with some general considerations for the analysis. Uh, first and foremost, um, the statistical analysis plan should be pre-specified. That is, it should be developed before conducting an externally controlled trial. These should include the primary analysis methods, key sensitivity analysis plans, and any control plans to control the chance of erroneous conclusions. The analytic methods chosen um, can vary, and the FDA does not uh, recommend any particular analytic method, but we do ask that a justification, including strengths limitations, for the methods be provided. Uh, the analysis plan should include a formal evaluation of comparability. It's important to determine similarity across uh, the arms, the experimental arm and the externally controlled arm, and it requires a selection of important population characteristics to compare, a method for that comparison, as well as criteria to demonstrate similarity. Lastly, it's important to consider what the anticipated effect size is. If it's modest, an externally controlled trial may not be appropriate, and we should pre-specify analyses for confounders or other sources of bias to ensure that whatever is observed in an externally controlled trial can ultimately be attributed to the intervention of interest. Next slide, please. A key component of any statistical analysis plan would be a plan for the missing data. A strategy for missing data in the SAP may include reasons why data are not available, characteristics, uh, characteristics of the patients with missing data, in particular as we compare them to those patients who do not have missing data, and sensitivity analyses to evaluate the impact of the missing data on the primary analysis. Um, when we consider why data are missing, we may be able to identify analytic methods for those types of missing data, but all of these methods generally require pretty strong assumptions, and these may be unverifiable or difficult to justify, in addition to the other types of analytic methods that require assumptions for externally controlled trials. So layering all of these assumptions may make it extremely difficult. Uh, a one specific type of missing data may be those that are missing due to intercurrent events, and these are considered a special case of missing data. The chosen S demand and corresponding statistical analysis plan should account for these events. And we should note that some intercurrent events may be, not be captured in external control data sources from real world data, uh, just in the nature of the real world data itself uh, that they, they may not be specific enough to capture important events such as these. Next slide. Additionally, we should be careful regarding misclassification or mischaracterization of available data, which can occur when the value of the measurement is assigned to an incorrect category for subsequent analysis. This may potentially affect estimates of the observed drug and outcome association. In real world data sources, different quantitative or qualitative descriptions of the same measure may be assigned to different categories by different healthcare providers. This concern is maybe somewhat less in clinical trials used as external control data sources, but it's noteworthy that the definitions in different uh, of variables in different clinical trials may vary also. So it's important to pay attention to this potential concern for any type of external control data source. Although we could use analytic meta, uh, analytical modeling methods to assess the potential impact of misclassification, in general, the best strategy is to avoid this bias by using objective and reliable measures for the data of interest. Next slide, please. 
Lastly, the statistical analysis plan may specify additional analyses that may help in the interpretation and understanding of an externally controlled trial. In particular, a very robust sensitivity analysis plan may be specified to test the vulnerability of trial results to assumptions in the analysis plan. And pre-specified supplementary analyses can provide further understanding of the treatment effect. Next slide, please. Our last section of the guidance provide considerations to support regulatory review. Next slide, please. It cannot be overstated that we recommend early engagement in communication with FDA. Sponsors can consult with the relevant review division early in the drug development program about whether or not it's reasonable to conduct an externally controlled trial rather than a randomized controlled trial. In this communication, a sponsor may consider including the rationale for why the proposed study design is appropriate, proposed data sources for the external control arm and an explanation of fitness for use, the expected statistical analyses, not necessarily a full statistical analysis plan at the very beginning, but some reasonable description of what may be uh, conducted, and plans to address the FDA's expectation for the submission of data. Next slide, please. It is imperative that sponsors include in the marketing applications relevant patient level data as required under FDA regulations for both the treatment and external control arms. If sponsors do not use their own data for the external control arm, they should structure their agreements with the data owners to ensure that patient level data can be provided to the FDA. Next slide, please. Uh, this concludes our description of the draft guidance. Uh, the guidance is available under docket number FDA 2022-D2983, and you may submit either electronic or written comments on the draft guidance, either electronically or with written submissions as described on this slide. I believe there's also links in the uh, webinar to the docket itself for your convenience. Next slide, please. And lastly, we would like to acknowledge the many, the many offices and centers across the FDA that contributed to this guidance. Next slide, please. Thank you very much for your time today. Fabulous. Uh, Dr. Raman and Dr. Mishra Kalyani, that was a really helpful um, uh, overview and then highlighting for us, taking your regulatory highlighter to the guidance document. So really appreciate that. And now it's time for us to turn to discussion. Um, we have a good amount of time here, which is great because I have a number of questions in the queue to uh, ask. And so I want to invite each of our speakers back to the stage and we will move to the, uh, addressing some of those questions. So if Dr. Kankato, Dr. Raman, and Dr. Mishra Karaligani could rejoin me, there we go. Um, Dr. Kankato, I'm going to turn to you first with just, I want to I want to double check uh, my thinking on the guidance document. Um, it, like many in the audience, I don't live and breathe these documents the way that you do. But one of the ways I think about this guidance document, it, you know, we often say that um, real life it, or that clinical trials rather are not real life when we think about drug performance, right? That there's just kind of a difference there. And this guidance seems to be the the flip side so if, if clinical trials are not real life from the flip side real life care is not a clinical trial from a data perspective is that right am i in the ballpark there uh yeah you're on to something uh susan so and it's a very important but broad conceptual issue um just thinking about how i might respond to that uh in this in the current context of this webinar i think i'm going to invoke validity and generalizability. And at the risk of oversimplifying and for all the epidemiologists and statisticians out there, give me a little bit of slack. Uh, but the idea is that when we think of randomized trials, things can go wrong, but given randomization and a prospective infrastructure, you know, we have on, on balance, on average, quote unquote, higher confidence in the validity, say then let me start at the other end of the spectrum, an observational cohort study, which could have, doesn't always, but on, in general, 
as high generalizability if it's all real world data. So, you know, if trials have very rigid and severe inclusion exclusion criteria, uh, the generalizability suffers. We get that. What's interesting, based on your question, is here today, we're sort of in the middle of that continuum where we have an externally controlled trial. Now, it's even more complicated, as Pallavi mentioned, and Motir as well. Uh, if the external control arm is from another clinical trial, we have all clinical trial, sorry, non real world data uh, uh, involved. On the other hand, if it's from a so called real world data source, uh, that's not the case. Um, but again, validity and generalizability are, are always in play. But I will point out, even when you have the external control arm for an externally controlled trial coming from a prior clinical trial, do we all agree on this call that it, it's not an observational, aka non-interventional study, but we're going to hear about, you know, we're going to expect to see propensity scores, all of the issues that Pallavi emphasized so nicely. So it's more of a continuum than an either or. And one of uh, the recurring themes is it's a false or if, if not false, an oversimplified dichotomy. Uh, and we try to never say it's real world RCTs or real world evidence. And so as we know, randomized trials, say point of care trials can generate real world evidence. So you're uh, sorry, your question is bringing up so many important topics. I'm trying to contain myself to the strict <laughs> and narrow uh, comment that you, you your question that you asked, but there are so many important points. So thank you for that uh, for that latitude, Susan, and, and everyone else on this webinar. Absolutely. Then I've got now I, I've got the I wanted to make sure that I was was squaring up with the, the the concept and how things all aligned there. Then one more question to make sure that we kind of square up and align. You reminded us that this is um, a guidance within a series of guidance documents. Um, would you just remind us of that structure again? Yes, and here's where, again, as you said, uh, we sort of eat, sleep, and breathe this uh, this stuff at FDA for all the right reasons. We hope that the guidance documents are helpful. Uh, but uh, your, one of the slides that you presented has it very nicely. This is a recorded webinar, so you know we won't put the slides up now, but folks can go back. I'm going to rely on my, my memory here. And if I start mentioning months as well as year, the four guidances that preceded this one in the webinar series were all in late 2021. Uh, we were, again, using the same general structure. But the way to think about this, why does this make sense? We used a split, not a lumped approach. This uh, would have been a long time in waiting and a very, you mentioned 17 or so pages. It would have been umpteen pages if we tried to do an Uber guidance on all things real world data, real evidence. It does come at a small price of how do these interrelate. So this gives me an opportunity to uh, hopefully clarify a bit. Taking things out of chronological order, uh, we decided to lump within the split, sorry, the EHR slash claims guidance that happened to be September of 2021 focuses intensively on uh, those two types of uh, data sources as uh, generating potentially real world evidence. I will say this is a chance for me to say, please use the docket. We look at the docket. We take your comments seriously. I do remember, uh, don't remember who said it. So if you're on the call, you can smile privately. But someone said, why didn't we split the EHR claims guidance into two guidances to emphasize the differences between the two? A, a fair question. We decide, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. We decided to mini lump, if I can use that term, uh, those two types. But EHR claims uh, to focus on intensively on validation and uh, et cetera. Uh, the data standards guidance, and, and I'm sorry, the, let me go out of order. As I said, the registries guidance, which was November of 2021, unless I'm mistaken, that's the second type of real world data source. And again, we could have maybe done all three together, but we decided that registries were distinctive enough to warrant that. And I will point out another complexity, right? If, if you have a registry, we can consider that primary data collection, even though that primary data could be used later in a non-interventional 8K observational study. So the landscape is more uh, complex than first meets the eye, and we just have to be careful. I use shorthand as well, but we have to be precise with their terminology. Getting back to the guidances, it was October of 2021, our data standards guidance. Uh, clearly, uh, well, two things. One is clearly the data standards regulations have survived the test of time quite well. But at the same time, we understand that no one envisioned nor could have envisioned decades ago the era of real world data, real world evidence. So it is a little bit of a square peg in a round hole. We cannot on a dime come up with new regulations and we don't have the experience, even if we rushed it through, we want to know what we're what we're talking about in an in informal uh, way, phrase of way of saying it. So the data standards uh, hopefully is very helpful 
to guide stakeholders with regard to uh, how to handle real world data. Uh, and then the regulatory considerations, last but not least, uh, was in December of 2021. And that's where, our, again, our IND 21 Code of Federal Regulations 312, you know, don't talk about non-interventional, uh, aka observational studies. So somewhere in between new regulations and a simple do the right thing as a, uh, as a guiding post, we came up with the guidance with, again, multiple offices, multiple centers involved that give a, a good sense of, of how to approach. Now, uh, that leaves out the design uh, aspect and the guidance agenda for 2023. This wasn't designed that far in advance. It just turns out that the three guidance, uh, three guidance documents on design are the most recent and the latest in the pipeline. Uh, so when they're ready, when, they, when they're cleared, you'll see them. But in the meantime, we have the landscape covered uh, with randomized trials, externally controlled trials, and non-interventional studies going from sort of randomized to non-randomized. That's not the chronological order. We're here to talk about externally controlled trials, but that's that's where we're at. Hopefully this makes sense. If, if others know it so well, I don't mind the redundancies for those who don't know it so well. Hopefully this is helpful if you go back to, I don't remember the slide number, but clearly, uh, Susan, your question uh, is important to make sure that we keep the big picture in focus as we dive into the details about this one particular guidance. Excellent. Um, that uh, just wanted to make sure I was standing in the right place and thinking about the the, the guidance documents. So that that's really helpful. So let's let's dig into that detail now. Um, and Dr. Raman, I'm going to throw this one your way. Uh, addressing bias was obviously an important component of the guidance document, the draft document. So how can bias be reduced in externally controlled trials? Right. Um, thanks for this question. And as we explained in the guidance, that reducing the potential for bias in the externally controlled trial is best addressed in the design phase. A well-designed study can increase confidence in the study findings. And one specific types of bias that we showed in the presentation also highlighted in the guidance is immortal time bias which can arise if the index dates for the start of follow-up in the treatment arm and the external control arm are not selected appropriately, which could lead to the inflated treatment effects. And bias can also occur if the outcomes assessment in the treatment arm and the external control arm differ based on the sources of data involved or the criteria used to study, establish the outcomes. So whenever possible, Using a contemporaneous control arm can also help to reduce the bias. In addition, the sponsor should develop a priority plan for assessing the impact of confounding factors and the sources of bias with quantitative or qualitative bias analysis used to evaluate these concerns, and that could increase the confidence in the study findings. Again, uh, bias can also arise from missing data which was discussed by Dr. Mishra Kalyani. In general, patients in both the trailers must be comparable, and the guidance discusses patient comparability in terms of geography, diagnosis, prognosis, treatments, and other factors. So I'll pause there. That's really helpful. And so to, to paraphrase a bit, um, to address the bias, you've got to, to come in with a plan early, like before you start and then exactly. be planning ahead also to, to monitor and engage throughout. Is of that... course, yeah. yeah. Right. Okay, excellent. Uh, let's move to a second question, and I'm gonna throw this one your way, Dr. Mishra Kalyani. Um, how can we make sure that outcomes and important variables are ascertained similarly between the experimental and the control arm? That's such an important question. Uh, thank you. Uh, certainly the evaluation of the similarity of assessment of outcome or other important care uh, covariates is a key element of our regulatory review process. In general, we can review these definitions um, of the variables when the data source is selected. So in the design phase and when data source is selected, to ensure that the external control data are fit for purpose. It's a good first step to ensure comparability. 
Then when the uh, data are analyzed, we can kind of explore these variables and their relationships with other measured information in each arm to provide further insight into the similarity of ascertainment. So another admonition, if I may, of thinking ahead you know, or, or beginning or you know, addressing early and then continuing to, to monitor. Excellent. And the mention of comparability brings to mind questions relating to data access, which you mentioned, to ensure that FDA can compare the same variables across trial uh, arms. Who wants to uh, jump into the data access question pool? Uh, I could do that, although Pallavi and Motir are certainly more than capable, since it relates back to, to your question, I think. Uh, your earlier question about the different guidance is we do have some redundancy and we're trying to manage it so that it's not um, you know too much in the way of copy paste but in this case let's just answer the question directly right uh we really want sponsors to engage with the relevant review division early on you hear this time and time again uh, but in this case it's regarding expectations for access to real world data for a control arm since we're here talking about externally controlled trials but also it could be for the trial arm uh depending on the nature of, of the of the study but we are talking about the regulatory requirements for submission of patient level data for clinical studies that are included in a marketing application. So we're not making this stuff up, if you will, on the fly for externally controlled trials. We're just trying to make it work. So now we recognize in some cases the data will be owned by other entities, someone else. Uh, so ideally, sponsors should have agreements in place to ensure that the relevant patient level data can be provided to FDA. Now, uh, we've already encountered circumstances where a sponsor says they cannot submit uh, such data through traditional means. Uh, there are some other regulatory pathways, and our again, our regulatory considerations guidance from December 2021 talks about this. Uh, I don't mean to sort of drop uh, a few hints, so to speak, and then walk away, but we really don't have time to go into gory detail. But a pre-IND or a type 5 drug master file, if you search for either of those in the 2021 regulatory considerations guidance, one can find the option. We're not saying it's a get-out-of-jail-free card. Uh, it's beyond the scope of this webinar, but just to mention that there are pathways. We will try to do uh, make, make things work, but it has to be something that works and that uh, adheres to our regulations at the same time. Does that help, uh, Susan? It does, because that you know, access to that data is obviously essential in your review, and so it, it, Thanks for reminding us too. There's that that other um, guidance which speaks to how how that might be done, but it's it's not a question of of whether it's in fact how. Thank you. All right. So, um, oh, this is a good one. So, uh, are there, or I shouldn't ask, say, are there, but what are examples <laughs> where the FDA has accepted? an externally controlled trial, and what was the source of the control arm data? Um, Dr. Concato, do you wanna take that one too? Yeah, I'll go one more time and then probably ask Pallavi for uh, a little color commentary, if I may, because the one example that pops into mind is the approval of linitumumab, uh, a, a T-cell antibody approved, I think it was 2018 for a specific type of acute lymphoblastic leukemia. I, I have this on slides that I use in other contexts, but basically, the drug had been studied in a single arm trial, and the primary outcome was, I think, partial or complete hematologic remission. The results were compared to EHR data on patients who did not receive the study drug. And again, all the things that Motir and Pallavi mentioned had to be taken into account. So to say that it used inverse probability of treatment weighting is true, but that's the tip of the iceberg in terms of what needed to be done. And again, Pallavi, you, you, you could say more, but basically if, you, if I fast forward to the review, there was actually, I think, an advisory committee as well, and several publications are available in Blood, I, is the journal that pops into mind and elsewhere. Uh, that's an example. Uh, not to put too much weight on any one example, so for equal opportunity purposes, I'll mention a second one just by name, and, and shout out to our CBER colleagues, Olgensma, was approved by CBER, uh, also using an externally controlled trial, but again, time doesn't allow. I think the let the record show that we not only have approved externally controlled trials, but we've approved such trials before the era of real world evidence, and they weren't called real world evidence studies. They were just called either historical control trials or studies or whatnot. But Pallavi, anything anything to add in general or on the lenitumumab example? Sure, uh, thanks, John. You know, I, I'll certainly echo John's um, enthusiasm for the fact that we have 
included external control data in the regulatory process, you know, well, well before even the framework for real world evidence was uh, published. Um, I'll also note, though, that in those, at least in the case for glenitumumab, it was not the pro considered the primary evidence of efficacy. It, it was considered supportive evidence of efficacy. And, and I do think that that distinction is important, uh, particularly for any sponsors out there who are thinking about designing a clinical trial and incorporating an external control arm. The weight of the evidence will really depend on the quality of the data and the completeness of the data and how much there, therefore we can rely on the inference we can make from that externally controlled trial. That's a really important point, Pallavi. Thank you for mentioning it. I think we, you know, uh, prograph to Carlomus comes to mind as an example where so-called real-world evidence was used uh, for adequate and well-controlled uh, to meet our adequate and well-controlled standard. But we're really, everything we're talking about today uh, doesn't take into, it's not that it doesn't take into account. We're leaving aside for future discussions what role the evidence will play. And I know we talked about supportive or confirmatory versus adequate and well-controlled. So I just want to emphasize the point that you just uh, made so, so our stakeholders are get the message loud and clear. Thank you. Excellent. Um... So I'm going to pivot a little bit and talk on statistical frameworks. So I think, Dr. Mishra Kalyani, that means I'm coming back to you. So if you're ready, the draft guidance does not mention different statistical frameworks like Bayesian or Frequentist. Can you comment on whether there are any preferred frameworks or methodologies? Absolutely. Uh, you're absolutely right that uh, the guidance does not mention any specific statistical frameworks for externally controlled trials. And I think this is really because there are a lot of different analytical approaches that are applicable to this type of study design. And each of those have their own set of advantages and disadvantages. So really, we are open to uh, various types of proposals um, for different types of statistical methodology, um, but they really just need to be accompanied by a justification that includes a characterization of the advantages and the disadvantages of the chosen methodology. Great. So you're not closing the door to no. any or opening the door to any. Mm -hmm. It's tell us what you'd like to use and why. Exactly. Okay. Great. And thanks for being our on the spot person on BioStat. <laughs> and anytime I get to say Bayesian on a webinar, I'll take it. Um, let's uh, turn to another. Let me pull one here. Okay. This one is probably coming back to you, uh, Dr. Raman. Uh, how can sponsors plan and design a trial where the need for or source of an external control arm hasn't yet been confirmed? Well, the sponsor should be clear from the planning stages of a trial as to appropriate control for the trial and finalize their study protocol before initiating the externally controlled trial, uh, including selection of the external controller, their analytic approach, rather than selecting a control arm after the completion of a single arm trial, as you mentioned in the grant. And as stated before, sponsors should pre-specify the study data sources and baseline eligibility criteria, that is their inclusion exclusion criteria, among other design elements to minimize the sources of biases. And again, as mentioned in the guidance, the sponsor should provide a justification for selecting or excluding relevant data sources and demonstrate that the choice of a final analytic data set for the control arm aligns with the research question of interest and it wasn't chosen to favor any particular study results and we couldn't emphasize more that engaging early with the agency or the review division prior to conducting any such trial is very important and each particular scenario will be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis uh so i think that let that that was a great question to underscore um plan and justify and and come in with uh, why it is that you might want to use uh, an external control arm and your analytic right. approach beforehand. Um, and then always good for the admonition to communicate early. I, um, I have actually heard for 
quite a long time that one of the single greatest predictors to a, a drug navigating the, the review process is how early they had a substantive conversation with the review division to, to explore questions and, and resolve questions specifically like this. Of course, each drug is different, its disease is different, therapeutic area is different, and these are more kind of case by case basis. So, I encourage everyone to communicate early. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Um, so, our next question we talked a little bit about this, but uh, uh, let's, uh, in, and actually, Dr. Concato, you mentioned it in our kind of initial <laughs> overview, but let's, let's talk a little bit more about the use of external control data from another clinical trial. Uh, thanks. I think the slides that were presented uh, in this webinar really cover it nicely and links to the guidance. So uh, what I'm saying will just be reinforcing what's in, in print. But we, we do acknowledge that uh, using data from another clinical trial as the external control arm uh, can have advantages. And what comes, what comes to mind is the benefits of just having protocol-based data collection as opposed to, uh, we don't blame the clinicians, but the real-world data that's collected at the bedside was collected obviously for a different purpose. But as was also emphasized, comparability is still needed between the two trial arms, in this case, both from trials regarding eligibility criteria, treatment concomitant treatments, assessment of outcomes, adverse events, intercurrent events. I mean, again, we have a, a table that's been mentioned with 10 domains. It doesn't have, you could lump, you could split. It, it's not a rigid 10, but we're trying to cover uh, the relevant points. So it's not a checklist either, uh, but it's a good way to organize one's thinking. So bias would be a concern in, in the context that your question brings up, Susan, if the external control arm, for example, is selected from a completed trial where the outcomes are already known, sponsors, stakeholders should convince us uh, that this was done in the up and up and not uh, knowing uh, ahead of time what the number was to sort of aim for. Uh, also, if the results of the external control arm are inconsistent with prior experience, it, it's possible that that trial is right and everything else is wrong. Uh, but on, on, on balance, we would think that uh, a multitude of studies, if they're done well, uh, would hold sway over one uh, study that happens to come our way in an external control trial package. And there are so many issues to talk about, but Pallavi and Motir covered them. Missing data, lack of concurrent data collection. Uh, again, it starts with the design that Motir was talking about, but it, it, it has to do with the data and the analysis that, that Pallavi covered. Uh, and actually, one thing that pops into mind, and I am not, I am not endorsing any particular uh, organization nor any particular part of FDA, but I think we're going to see more of this, right? Transcelerates historical trial data sharing project, something along those lines, uh, is an effort to catalog uh, trials and OCE's uh, project data sphere as well in terms of internal to FDA. Uh, they're not the only efforts in this space, but you know, in the era of real world data which is why we're here, right? It used to be a paper chart review if you wanted to do something along these lines. Now the data are there, but the question is the reliability, the relevance. It also gives me a chance to say that in our splitting as opposed to lumping our guidance is it, just because we don't mention something in the design guidance doesn't mean that we've changed our mind. So in terms of the accuracy, the completeness, the traceability of data, which is mentioned multiple times in other guidances, that still applies. Uh, we just have to against balance redundancy and uh, and specificity, if you will, in each and every guidance. Uh, so let me stop there, uh, Susan, and to to stick to your question. Yeah, and and so reminding us to to knit things to to knit knit the guidance documents together in in application. But it also strikes me as you mention, um, you know, initiatives that are that are ongoing efforts in this space that the the guidance is about how to do this, it is not a message of don't do this. It's it's how to, to think about it and how to proceed with an externally controlled um, right. arm. Right. Rec recognizing that a lot can go wrong, more things can go wrong than a clinical trial and hesitate, pause, or at least consider whether or not a randomized trial is feasible. But again, that, that's answering a different uh, question that you didn't ask. But I might. We still have we have time for just <laughs> okay. a couple more. So well, why, why don't you go on? All right. Let me the quick one here on um, could we briefly discuss what role natural history data can play in an externally controlled trial? Who wants to jump on that one? Um, Susan, I can okay. <laughs> take this one. Yeah. So yeah, we, we are seeing submission with lots of natural history data. So that's a good question. 
Like FDA regulations recognize the use of historical control, a type of external control in an adequate and well-controlled study under certain circumstances. So the suitability of such controls will be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on the disease, therapeutic area, outcomes of interest, et cetera. But in general, the natural history data may be better served as a control in certain situations where the disease course is predictable and the treatment effect is large. Uh, as simple as that. In some cases, the natural history data are part of the general medical knowledge of the disease course. For example, tumors don't shrink in the absence of a treatment or tumor being known to have a high probability of progression in a defined time period. So those are more appropriate scenarios uh, that can be used. Our We have a guidance, the 2019 draft guidance on the natural history studies for drug development um, in rare disease cases also talks about this topic, so I'll uh, refer to that guidance as well. Excellent. So there's there's definitely some some texture there to dig into it and and um, and under, understand and some parameters in the guidance. Sure. Um, I think we have time for just uh, I'm going to try and fit in two more questions. Uh, so what are the implications of this guidance? relating to those control arms that include both concurrently randomized controls and external control data. Uh, Dr. Mishra Kalyani, is that that one headed to you? Yeah, I, I, I can take it. Um, and it's a really great question, but unfortunately, I think it's a little beyond the scope of this webinar. Um, so maybe you will get that last question. in. <laughs> but we do encourage sponsors thinking about this type of trial design to really reach out to the relevant review division in the same way we have for our external controls, uh, it, it externally controlled trials throughout the rest of this discussion regarding um, this specific development program. Great. So we have time for one more question. Can an externally controlled trial be conducted for a non-rare disease? Uh, who wants that last word for today? Um, I could uh, take a stab at it. I think, you know, to say that it doesn't have a simple or straightforward answer doesn't shouldn't be viewed as a dodge. I think the question might be, should a trial be conducted on a case-by-case -case basis? And I think for non-rare diseases, on balance, uh, if the more that there are enough patients generally to enroll in a traditional randomized trial, uh, we know that that offers concurrent randomization, of course, but also a prospective infrastructure that takes care of a lot of the problems we've been talking about today. Uh, but I, it's not as if this is limited only to oncology or rare disease, but I think we, even in oncology and rare disease, sometimes traditional trials can be done. Uh, so as we mentioned in the guidance, I think sponsors really have to take their time to consider whether to conduct an externally controlled trial. Can the study generate convincing evidence to distinguish the effect of the drug from the impact of bias? And this goes back to what we were talking about however many minutes ago. The bar, the evidentiary bar is the same, but there are different levels if we're talking about adequate and well control versus uh, something that's uh, an add on in addition to uh, say it's a confirmatory uh, trial as opposed to the, the primary supportive evidence. Uh, so the guidance does indeed talk about this gets back to that question that you have asked or I'm, I'm saying I, I twisted it into a question Susan that there are many things that could go wrong in an externally controlled trial more so than in a traditional randomized trial. And that, that table of, of comparability has the 10 domains. We offer it as a good place to start. We, it, it is not a checklist. I think I said that before. And there is no easy way out. There's no free lunch. A careful evaluation is needed. But we hope that this guidance helps to provide a path forward when everything is uh, suitable. Uh, it's FDA's current thinking, and it should help sponsors we trust uh, guide, guide you along the way. But in the meantime, if anything's unclear, one more shout out for the docket. Uh, uh, please feel free to use the docket to give us feedback, and we'll try to convert the draft to final and make it even stronger than it hopefully is right now. Thank you very much, Susan. Excellent. Well, there's certainly um, a lot of of um, content in the in the guidance document as you have all helped us walk through. That is all the time that we have questions. That is all the questions that we have time for today. Um, and really appreciate each of you, um, you know, providing the overview and then responding to these questions so that we could learn more about each of them, uh, each of the, the questions and the content of the guidance. So many thanks to you. I will just put in another note to remind folks to uh, submit comments on the draft guidance. I'll add the deadline of May 2nd 
Um, and then we have a note there of how you might do that. Again, thank you all for joining us. We will be posting the recording of this webinar on our website soon. And uh, with that, we are at the end of our time. Thank you so much for joining us and take care. Have a great afternoon. Thanks everyone. Thank, thank you. you.